with anything. Yeah. You know, and the kids were running around, and he, Ian was sort of, you know, doing his best, like, and um, to help me too. But it was the selfishness again, sort of, well, I just was so wrapped up in my self-pity yeah. and my problem with these tranquilizers that nothing else matters. You said it was selfish. Did you feel selfish at the time? Was no. it only looking back on it that you feel selfish? No, it's only, it's only looking back now. I know you've reduced the dosages and, in fact, give them up almost completely, but how, how did that come about? Did you get help and, if so, from who? Um, well, it was mostly Ian. If it wasn't for him, you know, I don't know what I'd have done. It was sort of... He was like... Um, he was like a doctor. And not not in the sense that he's a doctor. You don't get me wrong by that. He was like... He had the time to say, like, yeah, this has gone far enough now. I want to know, you know, why. I do want to see you like this. The kids don't want to see you like this. I want you to be out, you know, normal sort of thing. But what's normal and what's not normal? And um, it's sort of, he was saying, instead of just throwing them down the toilet, you know, go down, instead of three, four, or five a day, it was two. And that was the hardest. So you just gradually reduced the dose? Yeah, until I got really uh, bad, then he'd, he'd give in and mm. go down and get me to <laughs> Have you ever come across someone now who's at the same stage you were when you originally went to the doctor for tranquilizers? Would you give them any advice? Yeah, I'd um, try and, uh, you know, explain to them that if they are to be on tranquilizers, to not be foolish and take more than they should do. Mm. Abuse them sort of thing, which I, I did abuse them. Mm. And also to try and sit down and work out where you've gone wrong in your life and that you, you can't go on the rest of your life crying over spilt milk. You've mm. got to sort of nip, nip it in the bud and instead of living back in your past by going, if only I hadn't done this, if only I hadn't done that, mm. you can go, well, tomorrow is the first day of the rest of my life, and you can only start from that day mm. instead of going, saying, oh, eight months ago I was felt like this. Say, fair enough, eight months ago I, I felt like this, but today I'm going to try and not feel like that. I'm going to take deep breaths and take things calmly and not rush around like a bull in a china mm. shop. And if something goes wrong, say, oh, slow down, you know, make it go right for a change. So, but, like, maybe a lot of people haven't got what I've got is like Ian. Do you think, from what you've said, that getting off them and staying off them really involves your own attitude towards it? Oh, well, I still have them in the drawer. Mm. Sometimes it's like a little mechanism in your head going, yeah, I'm in the door. Mm. But, like, now I think, oh, well, I just said my gravy's got lumpy <laughs> today, you know. Just make another pan of gravy instead of freaking out over it. It's hard to do. It's hard for someone who doesn't understand. I had said easy for the doctor to go, oh, well, you really must pull yourself together and you're being really childish and stupid. Mm. Maybe you are, but at the time, you, you feel so um, alone in yourself and it doesn't matter how uh, anyone else tells you. It's like a, a monster inside you that, and it destroys you. It, it destroys um, destroys you as a person. It makes you like... Uh, how can you explain it? It makes you like... Uh, it's sort of selfish. Nothing else matters, only you. You know, you're the one suffering, no one else is, and yet you don't see the suffering that everyone else is around you. And that's the shame of it. That's the embarrassment of it. OK, thanks very much, Chris. Thanks. I want to
I do a lot of dancing for my school, but I put that up in the tail. I I think it depends on the news of the moment, you know, what is in the public mind. There might be some specific uh, incidents which will trigger it off. Uh, for instance, uh, my dad here, the, the sad death of Jason Fitzsimmons last year, uh, the lad at 14 in Croxteth who died, uh, having been dabbling with a number of drugs. Hasten to add, he died from an overdose of sleeping tablets, but I think the, uh, the inquest did show that he'd been messing about with uh, heroin and cannabis and methadone, and that was at 14 years of age. Very, very sad situation. But as an immediate response to that, the public at large, not just in Croxford, but right throughout the area, were incensed, incensed by this, this waste of a life, and they gave us a great deal of information. And it seems to me that it almost requires something, some big story to break, to uh, prompt people, you know, well, we've all got an axe to grind in this, we've all got a role to play, let's get something done about it. So the action line is still going, and we ask people to, to ring in. They don't have to give their names. They will get a kind of a coded signal, set, signal saying, this is the police hotline. If you've got any information, just speak after the tone. And it does add that uh, if you want to speak to a police officer urgently, like, you know, something is happening now and we want some immediate attention, they ask you to dial 999. Now, the number of the hotline is 777. Double four, double four. So it's, it's quite an easy number to remember. But if you can't remember it, there are several dozen um, corporation buses and taxis and black hackney cabs who carry the advert on the, the side or on the rear, inviting people to, to ring in and give information about drug dealers, drug pushers. And as I say, it's not for the benefit of the police. It's for the benefit of each and every one of us wherever we live. We don't want to live with drug dealing going on down the street where our kids might be at risk. So it's a matter for all of us, not just the police. And as I say, the, the, the whole thing has been a, a great success. Other forces throughout the country use it, the customs use it as well. But uh, I would say to anybody, uh, please give us information and as much detail as you possibly can. Like, what time of day does it happen? How do they do it? Do they go in the front door or the back door or what? And if we get, we're given this information, it'll save us an awful lot of time keeping our own observations, if you like, and enable us to get to the uh, get to the crux of the problem quickly and take out the dealers. Um, if you could speak to the Home Secretary tomorrow and be granted anything you asked for to assist in the fight against drugs, what would your request be? Well, it's funny you should say that because only a few months ago I did have the opportunity to speak to the Home Secretary. He did come down here, 
Uh, he had a number of things on in the region, and he made a special trip to come here to talk to me and the Chief Constable uh, about the drug problem. And he's very, very interested and very, very concerned about it. Uh, if I had uh, an opportunity to, to ask him for something, uh, it might surprise you. I don't think we need any more police to be concentrating on the problem. What I would ask him for, and I say it's relating to, to what I said before, are facilities. We have a big clinic at Hope Street. We have the uh, Merseyside Drugs Council. We have a clinic at Southport. There's a clinic in uh, Arrow Park in Birkenhead. There's one at Whiston. There are a number of clinics throughout the region. They're, they're rather spread out. There are plenty of other facilities, the probation service, social service, and what have you. Plenty of professional people who are involved in it. But what I would like to happen is if we could prove a need that people wanted more residential facilities or clinic facilities that we could ask for them. In other words, if I could see or we could see uh, in the area that we need a lot more clinic facilities where people can go with a genuine desire to get help and to get rid of a drug problem. That's what I'd like to see. We don't need more police. We don't need more customs officers. Let's kind of try and treat the people that we identify on the streets now and give them the help to make them ordinary human beings again. That's what I ask for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.